Wow, look at this. Thank you so much for showing up. We want to thank, we have been shepherded around by so many nice people since we got here. It takes so many people to put a festival like this together. And we, that was the first thing we wanted to do is to thank everyone. Uh, so this is a little unusual. This is like, it, it, I don't usually interview Sherrod on stage. I really enjoy when I can say, just answer the question, Senator. <laughs> but the more we talked about it, the, the invitation came from uh, the Humanities Festival, and immediately other groups have duplicated it, so I'll be doing some of this around the country, but you were the first to invite us to do it like this. And the more we talked about it, uh, I thought maybe it made a little bit more sense in that um, the only person who even comes close to knowing how hard he's worked on this book and how long, more than a decade, is me. And, it's been interesting to watch some of the response to the book and people wanting to, first of all, they're just wondering, how did you find the time to write? Because you're a US senator, right? And they, they're they curious about the process. And um, why don't you tell them a little bit about how you came up with the idea of this book, OK? Sure. Um, thank you. And, and I echo Connie's words. And thanks Into the mouth. Uh, to, thanks to all of you for, sorry. <laughs> See how it starts? Nobody else went, OK. Uh, but I, <laughs> I'm honored to be here. And it's, it's a thrill to be at the field to do this. Um, and thanks all the backstage people that were so helpful. Um, I was elected in 06, in January of 07, uh, senators decide, freshman senators were deciding where we sit on the Senate floor, and much of the early days in the Senate is done by seniority, which office, you, which office you claim, which desk you sit at, the committees that you try to get on are pretty much done by seniority. So there were 10 freshmen scurrying around on the Senate floor deciding which of these 10 mahogany desks uh, to choose to sit in, sit by, and um, I uh, had been told, I just realized you're not sitting behind a post at Wrigley Field or Old Comiskey, you're sitting in the Senate and the views are fine from everywhere. So I'd heard that you, if you, that senators carve, sort of like middle school, carve their names in, the, in their desk drawers. So I pulled out a number of desk drawers and the fourth one I pulled out, I saw the names Hugo Black, uh, George McGovern, uh, Gore of Tennessee, uh, Taylor of Idaho, and then I saw one word, Kennedy. So Ted Kennedy sat maybe five desks away. I said, Ted, come here a second, would you? And he walked over, and I, I pulled the desk drawer. I said, Ted, which brother's desk was this? And he said, well, it's got to be Bobby's because I have Jack's. So I thought, okay, you can have Jack's. You got here first. <laughs> but um, so I started thinking about the names in the desk around the same time. Connie, Connie loves history and knows I love history, and I've always believed you can do your job, whatever your job, better in business and social services and university or in politics if you know a little more about the history of the institution or the place of business, whatever. So Connie had gone online and ordered um, 15 books maybe about the Senate or about Senate senators whom we had heard of at that point that were long, long, long past. And, um, one of the, that she, she found, the, many of these books were out of print. They were all very inexpensive, because who reads this stuff? And so... Um, well, all of you do, so thank well, you. Yeah. So um, anyway, then, then I just began to think about the, the, the contribution they had made to this country, this progressives. And I wrote the book only for the same reason I, I wear this lapel pin. It's 20 years ago, I was at a Workers' Memorial Day rally, and this uh, pen, mo most members of the Senate and House wear a pen Given us by Into the, 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 the given us by the the the, um, the Congress, a uh, uh, Sen Senator House pen. This is a depiction of a canary in a birdcage. The mine workers took the canary down in the mines. They had no government or no union in those days that that cared or could had the wherewithal to help them. So they were really on their own. And it 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 says to me this, and the same reason I wrote the book was that um, I believe in the power of government to make people's lives better. And I began to think about senators that sat at this desk that did that, uh, came up with eight of them and began the process of writing. And that was that, that started 10, 11, 12 years ago and just was completed this year. Well, you thought you had completed it, what, three yeah. years in? Yeah, Talk about I, yeah, that a little bit. About, in about 2009. I mean, mar married to a writer who has accomplished as Connie has its advantages mostly, almost all advantages. <laughs> But um, it also required, let me just say it this way, it requires more work, and take that how you want it. Um, as a writer. So, as a mean. writer, it requires more work. Because <laughs> marriage is always easy, as you know. So, um, so, so I thought I had written a pretty good draft of these eight senators, and Connie read it, and she said, not even close yet, there's not enough. She said, an historian could have written these eight biographies. There's gotta be more of you and more about 
what it means to be in the Senate. And well, that was my perspective, yeah. that a historian could write a book like this, but you're unique in that you're a senator writing this book, so bring the senator into the book. And, it made, and it, I, I'm grateful that it took another seven or eight years, because it's a much better... <laughs> I am. <laughs> I wasn't grateful every moment over the last 84 months. No, he was not. Anyway, it got, but it got significantly better. It did, and I was right. So, and one of my, why did you clap when she said I was right? Um, one, of, one of the nice memories of this is Connie's, Connie's work, Connie's written, written two books, but this is her first novel. She's in the middle of it, come, which comes out next June. And she and I would sit, and the, particularly in the last couple of years, as I was finishing and she was kind of reaching the home stretch in her novel, um, we would sit at the dining room table sometimes and work at the same time on our books, which yeah, is, it was is quite a, a, moment. a fun memory. Yeah. yeah. Um, as you know, th as I was reading through various drafts, um, one of the things I couldn't get over is how much you were willing to put in that was not particularly flattering of these people that you picked. I mean, they are, in some ways, quite flawed human beings. And talk a little bit about why you decided to include all that. Yeah, I, I don't think you write anything that's an historical analysis or tract without being honest about the flaws and, the, and, and maybe the heroism of, of the characters about whom you write. And there are three of the eight, there are three in particular that, that let's just say, didn't have a good start. Uh, in their careers that were, in many ways, heroic at the end of their careers. And um, those three are, are Bobby Kennedy uh, and um, Al Gore and Hugo, most notably Hugo Black. Hugo Black is you, is the first chapter in the book. I, I write about Black and then I write about my Southern heritage, starting off the first essay. There's an essay after every biography. Um, that like Hugo Black, my mother was a product of the segregated South. My mom was born in 1920, we can talk about that in a moment. But Black, Black in 1926 joined the KKK, or right before he ran for the Senate. He later said that, he said I had two choices. I could join the KKK, which represented, he said, roughly half the voters, no black voters in Alabama in those days, as you know, or so few, inconsequential number. Um, half the voters were affiliated or sympathetic to the Klan, um, and, but the other group he could have joined were what were called the big mules, and they were the power companies, the coal companies, the steel companies that really ran Alabama. And he, cho he said later, I would have joined any organization that that I, where I could get votes, um, rather opportunistic and beyond that. So he, um, by, soon after he's elected, he renounced the Klan, but his voting record didn't really reflect that. It was only in his second term with, when Roosevelt saw Black as his favorite Southern senator, um, who Black, Black stepped up on one of the reasons we have a 40 hour work week and minimum wage and, and collective bargaining is Hugo Black, uh, he then, full circle 30 years after he came to the Senate as a member of the Supreme Court, as you know. Uh, Hugo Black was partly, maybe mostly responsible for there being a unanimous decision on Brown v. Board and to make the circle, to fill the circle out, Hugo Black was burned in effigy at his law school in Tuscaloosa um, because of Brown v. Board. And Kennedy, you know, Kennedy's journey was not as sharp, didn't start as low, but Kennedy worked for McCarthy, as you know. Um, his brother's assassination changed him to be sure. Um, and his visits, um, his, his, his going out and seeing the world change him. He was a, obviously a, a, a young man of privilege. Um, there's a wonderful Lincoln line, I love using this in Chicago, um, where Lincoln would tell his staff, you know, I, they, his staff would exhort him to stay in the White House, win the war, free the slaves, preserve the Union. Said no, Lincoln would say, no, I gotta get my public opinion bath. And Kennedy did that better than almost any elected official I've known of, and with more, and ultimately his empathy, uh, the, the empathy he showed and they developed in him really made him what he was. The Kennedy we all know, 66, seven and eight Kennedy. And the third one was Al Gore, and I, I won't go into that, but, but yeah. well, Gore had that same kind of heroism at the end, but not necessarily so And we're gonna talk about him, him a little bit more in a minute, I think, because um, I have another question. Yeah. Chair doesn't always know what I'm gonna throw at him, which, um, th that's fun too. Um, I want you to, t you had personal essays after each chapter of, of, of about these senators, and um, one of the ones that I love most is about family, about your mom. Oh, and speaking of family, I should mention that our 11-year-old grandson, Clayton, is here, and um, his mom, Stina, and our son, Andrew, 
who just took a job as a math professor at Lake Forest. So we'll be in Chicago a lot. Right. So I love that Clayton's gonna be able to sit here and, and listen to a little bit about a story about a great grandmother he barely knew. Um, when you, you're often asked, how did a guy who was a doctor's kid, right, in a small town, it, you know, and you got to go to the Ivy League, how'd you end up caring so much about workers and civil rights and women's rights? And it really, so much of it comes back to your mom, does it not? Emily Campbell Brown, talk about that a little bit, would you? My mom um, grew up in Mansfield, Georgia, town of 500. She met my father at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington. She worked for the OSS, which later became the CIA, and I didn't know my mother was a spook until she wasn't, but she, she had a fairly low-level job there as a secretary at that point early in her career in Washington. She met my dad at the Mayflower, then moved to Mansfield, Ohio with my dad, and she, um, she cared more than anything she cared about race. She, she said she found, um, she found segregation perplexing and confusing and confounding and then repugnant pretty early in her life. And she, um, she taught me about politics. I'm a doctor's kid and a teacher's kid. And she taught me about politics more through the eyes of civil rights than, than anything else. She used to talk during, the, during all the busing in the 1970s. She used to say, you know, when she'd hear people particularly critical of, of any, any uh, efforts to integrate, my mom would say, oh, we, had, we had forced busing when I was growing up in Georgia. Uh, black kids were bused past new white schools to go to inferior black schools, and that's how she looked at the world. And one of her, um, one of the things she did late in life, she died at 88. She was in hospice. Connie and I were with her, and my brothers too, right up till the end. But about two weeks, she, about a year before she died, she was the first one in the family to support Barack Obama uh, in the 2008 primaries, and. Uh, she was with him, I think, in 2007. Yeah, for sure she was. And she, um, so her last good day on earth was the inauguration, was January 20th, 2009. She was alert that day. She got out of bed the last day she got out of bed. She sent Connie and me to the inauguration. My brother stayed. She insisted we were there. Yeah. And she, um, she had that impact on me that, that because she, that's how she saw the world and she wanted to make sure her three boys um, cared about justice. She was a remarkable woman, a very strong woman, never lost her um, Southern accent. The first time I ever met her, I was 45 years old, dating a member of Congress as a journalist. That's really good news for your editor, by the way. And we had to go to a, a formal event, remember? And so I'm putting on this dress and she walks in, she says, Connie, would you like a necklace to go with that dress? And I said, well, Emily, I'm a little afraid it's gonna draw attention to my cleavage, and she said, well, isn't that what you're trying to do? <laughs> I had known her 20 minutes. That was the first time they met, imagine. <laughs> what most surprised you in researching of this book and in the writing? Yeah, um, I think the, the, the unevenness of these senators. I mean, I, I remember my brother was, um, was in something called the Concerned Officer Movement during the Vietnam War, and uh, he, was in, he was in the Navy. Um, he only was honorably discharged for anti-war activity. Uh, they didn't quite say it that way, but, but he was honorably discharged. But I remember I went to see him one time, and we went to a reception on Capitol Hill, and I saw these senators that, whose faces I had known from television or newspapers. Um, it was all white men then, as um, this book is about eight white male senators. Uh, because that's what the Senate was, and still is too much. I would argue, too, that the next eight senators that sit at this desk, um, I hope I don't leave soon, but the next eight senators that sit at this desk are, um, will be women and people of color and, and um, will be a more progressive Senate as a result. But I, I guess two things. One is the unevenness of these senators that nobody, I, I noticed with my brother, I just thought, no, 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 none of these are really giants. I mean, there are, there are, few giants among men and women, and there are few or no giants in the Senate. Um, so that, that surprised me a little, just thinking of history that way. I guess I'd say that. You know, you mentioned the Vietnam War, and uh, I think it's the chapter on Gore where it comes up, the, the whole notion of the value of public hearings. And uh, I imagine some of us in this room remember that. Some of us in this room might remember the Watergate hearings. A lot of Americans really knew nothing about what was going on with Nixon and Watergate until the public hearings happened. There's a lot of discussion right now, a lot of debate. What's the value of public hearings? 
particularly in the climate we're in right now, and we're about, it looks to be quite a dramatic series of public hearings. Can you talk about that a little bit, about the, yeah, how you addressed sure. it in the book? Yeah, go, go, back to, go back to January 1966, and in what is now known as the Kennedy Caucus Room, it's the, it's the room in Russell, the Senate Caucus Room in Russell, the Russell Building, um, a building after whom, a building whose name we should change, I, I, I think, sooner rather than later. Why Russell, is that? Russell was the great segregationist, the leading, segre the le most effective, not, not the most hateful. He wasn't Strom Thurmond, he wasn't Theodore Bilbo, but he was the most effective segregationist in the Senate from my mother's home state. But the, 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 the caucus room um, where this hearing was held was the scene of the Watergate hearings later. Prior to that, it was the Titanic hearings. It was the Kennedy, it's where Jack Kennedy announced his candidacy. It's where Bobby Kennedy later announced his candidacy. It's, it's where we on the Health, Education, Labor, Pension Committee wrote the Affordable Care Act. So it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's always the scene of, of great, eventually historical moments, often is. And um, these were hearings, they were the Fulbright hearings. Gore was on the committee. Gore became, I believe, the first Southerner to come out against Johnson's war against Kennedy Johnson, Kennedy's Johnson's, John's, Kennedy and Johnson's war. Gore was the only Tennessee politician in either house to oppose the war. Ted Kennedy later told me in his hideaway as I interviewed him for this book, I, I've read about 150 books and for, this, for the research and interviewed about 100 people and one of them was in Ted, Ted Kennedy's hideaway and he said those hearings changed the course of the war um, to the point that Lyndon Johnson uh, putting pressure on CBS got them to cut, to, to cut down their coverage of the war, uh, of the hearings. Um, they, CBS shut down the hearings early to run reruns of I Love Lucy, um, which is kind of funny, but really isn't, of course. And Fred Friendly, the CBS executive, quit over that, um, that decision. But that, that, that shows the, the power of public hearings. Um, that certainly was the case with Watergate. And I mean, that's, that's President Trump's biggest fear and Mulvaney's biggest fear and whoever the next chief of staff's biggest fear um, will be. So- What is their biggest fear their specifically? Their biggest fear is that there will be a light shown on, um, on misfeasance and malfeasance and um, perhaps treasonous um, actions by high ranking officials. And I think that that's, that's the fear that, that a lot of Republicans have that these hearings, if done right, um, will show that. And, and one of the things that the book did teach me is, is the power of hearings, but, but in a bigger way, the, the, the potential, and, I, and, and if you're in this, the longer you're in the Senate, the better you should get at this. And I, I see that with Dick Durbin, how he's done it so well. I see the potential with Tammy Duckworth doing this, is to f see how many opportunities there are to do things outside of the legislative process. It might be, um, it, 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 it might be, I call CEOs of big insurance companies and big banks, exhorting them in a, in a quiet way, don't plan to embarrass them, but exhorting them to raise their low paid food, food, food service workers, their custodians or security guards to raise, raise their wages to $15. I mean, there, there are things that the title that I have gets me in the door to do things like that. Uh, and that's really, the, 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 I've learned that from this book in part in the more the more you think about this job as a senator and the title that you get bestowed on you for six years at a time, temporarily to be sure that you can do these things. Um, when we walked in today, a gentleman came up to us pretty quickly, you might remember, and he basically was asking, if I listen to you today, am I gonna leave hopeful or more scared? <laughs> right? And we hear this a lot, long before the book came out, right? It's, yeah. where are the signs of hope here? And, so it gets to why now, why this book, the timing of which you hadn't, I mean, you have been working on it for a decade and suddenly we have the same agent. She thought, I think this is the time. You need to, you need to bring this out now. And it was, it's not an anti-Trump book. It's a, here's what happens it's when you- It's not a pro-Trump book either, honey. No, it's not. <laughs> You know, you have a real gift for stating the obvious. Can I just say that? Um, <laughs> but here's the thing, honey. Why, where's the hope in this book? What's, what's the hopeful message of this book? Uh, thanks for that. And I, the, hope, the hope is this, and I, I, I really do think that, um, if I start with this, this is not, this may be the worst, this, I won't say maybe, this is the worst president of our lifetime. This is, 
of, of the lifetimes of any of you in here, I think. This is, he, he may be the worst president in American history. I don't know a lot about James Buchanan, who was pretty bad, I guess, but, and Andrew Johnson. But, um, but this is not the worst time in our country's history. This is not, um, it's, it's not slavery. It's not the Civil War. It's not the Depression. It's not World War II. It's not the McCarthy days. I, I spoke to 100 clergy the other day in Cleveland um, at a temple, but the clergy were, were Muslims and Jews and Christians and, um, and Hindus, and, and they were all, uh, one person asked a question similar to the question Connie asked, and I, I said, if this were the McCarthy days, I'm not sure all of you would have been free to come to this meeting. So this is, this is not those days. So I'm optimistic because this isn't the worst imaginable. I mean, another four years of Trump would get worse for sure. But the reason I'm hopeful is I, this, one of the things this book shows is that is, is, the, is a sort of an analysis through these eight senators of the progressive eras we've lived through. Um, start with Wilson, when a racist himself, to be sure, but m many progressive things happened around the, in the teens with workers' comp and the Federal Reserve and a number of things. Then in the 30s, the progressive era with Social Security and collective bargaining in the 60s with Johnson, um, so many things that matter so much to our country, Medicare, civil rights, Medicaid, voting rights, Equal Opportunity Act, um, Head Start, Higher Ed Act, Wilderness Act, immigration, all those things. And each time we have huge victories as progressives, but they only last three or four years, but we hold on to those victories and we benefit, we play defense, but benefit for generations from the victories in those progressive eras. I think we very well, I mean, I'm not predicting this because it's too early to know this, but I think there's a reasonably good chance of a progressive era starting in 2020 when we do things, take something as simple as making childcare a public good, that um, people raising children in this country um, ought to have more support from their government like they do everywhere else, every other rich country in the world. And, and, and take that, thank you, and take that out way beyond just child care to vacation. I, 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 if I could tell this story, I was, story in, it, it? It was in, in, I was in um, Cincinnati speaking to oh, yeah. an AFL-CIO dinner several years ago, and there was, um, there were a crowd of 300 at this dinner, there was a table up front of middle-aged women um, half white, half people of color. There was one seat to take, one empty seat. And the people up front told me that, that somebody told me this was a, these were custodians and they had signed their first union contract, 1,200 bargaining units strong, first union contract with the Cincinnati downtown business owners. And that, that morning they had signed the contract. So I sat down at the table and I just said to the woman next to me, I said, what's it like to have a union now? And she looks at me and she said, I'm 51 years old. This is the first time in my life I will have a paid one week vacation. And that's, you know, that's a third of America. And um, it's not the people whose names you always know, it's people whose names you should know. It's the people who prepare your food and clean your offices and make you safe um, at work in many times. And so um, I think if, if, we, if we run this campaign, the, people for the Senate and the House and the White House run this campaign through the eyes of workers and honoring work and the dignity of work, uh, run the campaign through the eyes of workers and then come 2021, govern through the eyes of workers, there is a whole lot of reason to be optimistic. I wanna ask you. I wanna ask one more question then we're gonna open it to the floor because I have a feeling you have a lot on your minds. Um, you were limited in some ways by, by the confines of the desk, right, who you could write about. Is there anyone that you really are, are, were itching to write about but couldn't? Yeah, I, I would, if I, if I were to write another chapter, but I was, I was self, I was limiting myself to those eight senators, um, I would write about Humphrey. And I would write about Humphrey because I think that, you know, hum Humphrey did two things better than almost anybody else. He, he played inside, outside. I mean, think of the, the, the I think the two greatest, two greatest senators in, in American history, at least in the last 100 years, are, are Humphrey and Ted Kennedy. Kennedy, the last 20 years of his Senate career, Humphrey, his entire Senate career, civil rights, nuclear test ban treaty, so many things he did. But he worked on the inside, outside strategy. He understood how to, how to work with his colleagues and move them on issues, and he understood how to apply 
with outside groups putting pressure way before the days, of course, of social media to put pressure on members of Congress to do the right thing. The other thing, Humphrey, as most of you know, was, um, was called the happy warrior. And I think if you do this job with some joy, Connie's editor at Random House um, said, no whining on the yacht. And if you, you know, if you have these jobs, nobody wants you to be Eeyore. And boy, this is such a burden I have, and this is such hard work. Well, nobody really cares about that. If it's hard work, and if it's a burden, if it's if it's heavy, if it's any of that. So, approaching this with a with a, a modicum or an, an overflowing amount of joy um, makes you better at this job. And I would love to have explored that with Humphrey. But well, I've always said about Sherrod that his default button is set to joy, and he is in. Boy, is he a morning person. So. <laughs> How are we doing questions? I, do we have mics? Or do, okay, so I see Josh out there. Oh, good, the light. Well, hello. We have one right here. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. Sure, thank you. I drove down from uh, Milwaukee today to get to the event from Walkerville, where we had Act 10 for almost a year. I have a couple things. Um, who in the United States Senate, besides yourself, loves those of us in the union movement? Because I think there are so few. When are we going to get 1306 SB passed? When are we going to get Lordstown open again? And then for your wife, I see that we have a novel coming out. Who besides James Joyce are your, the people that you read the most? He's asking, but you're assuming he reads me, right? I mean, you're asking me? Um, you know, uh, oh, you want me to go? Well, my novel's about, a, it's called The Daughters of Erie Town, and it spans five decades in the life of a working class family in a small town in Ohio. So it's all about that. Without ever, the only time working class ever comes up is when they make fun of people who call them that. And those of you, I was the first in my family to go to college. And I'm sure there are many of you in the audience like that. And you know, we never really talked about that piece of our lives. It was just my dad vowed that none of his four children would ever carry a, a lunch pail to work again. And the reason I wrote this in part is my editor at Random House really wanted me to write fiction. I have the best editor in the world as far as I'm concerned. And she's got a lot of authors to show it. Her name is Kate Medina. And she said that working class is really underrepresented in modern literature. And I agree with that. I have many favorite authors. I would tell you that I really try hard to read a lot of women. Uh, but I will say one male author that's really good, I think, about workers is Richard Russo. He does a good job. Um, but when you look at people's lives and how you write it, I think Amy Bloom is wonderful, for example, in examining lives. Elizabeth Berg is another one. Um, but let's go to you then, and you answer his question about the senators. Sure. And I, I would add that Connie um, probably wouldn't be alive today if it weren't for her dad, her utility worker father, carrying a union card for three decades um, because she got asthma, an asthma attack at 16, long before we ever met, and uh, the Cleveland Clinic saved her life. So um, start with that. Uh, there, there are, I'm more hopeful than you. First of all, your senator in Wisconsin, Tammy Baldwin, is. I don't know. I don't know how many of, of my colleagues call themselves labor Democrats. Um, I do. I call myself that. There's a my, that first essay when I talked about my mom. I talked about the rest of my education um, on Fridays when the legis I was elected to the legislature when I was 21. Came back on Fridays when we weren't in session and often spent Friday at a steel worker or auto worker union hall talking to people about their kids, their dreams, the books they read. Um, including uh, Peter Donato, I think, who is from Chicago, called Christ in Concrete, and Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath, and and um, I, I one thing I'm, the, the by Germano, Germano by um, by Zola in a number of. I mean, it's so uh, you know we we don't few of few few members of the Senate anymore had parents who were in the union movement. That's part of the problem. But I could rattle off ten senators that that think like labor Democrats, whether they call themselves that or not. So there are a number of us. There aren't enough. Um, we don't see, we don't think about workers enough. Um, you come from the part of the country as I do. I mean, I remember when Illinois was clearly not a democratic state, when Governor Thompson in those days, and it was a swing state, and um, you became a democratic state, I think, because of the collar counties. 
couple with East St. Louis and, and Cook County, and so you, but but you weren't always that, and um, I, I, you know, so, um, but I, I do think that there, I mean, I, 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 I do think that if we, if we see this election through the eyes of workers more than we do, and I, more than we have in the past, that, that Democrats in the middle of the country will do just fine, and you know this election probably is about, I mean, it's certainly about the Electoral College, it's probably about, this region of the country, again, Illinois the exception, but your state of Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania and Ohio, um, Democrats, somebody said to me once that the Midwest is getting more Republican, again, Illinois accepted, the Demo Midwest is getting more Republican, but isn't there yet, the South is getting more Democratic, but isn't there yet, um, it's up to us to win at least one more time in the Midwest um, as the South gets more democratic, because I don't know if they're there yet. Thank you for mentioning Lordstown. As you probably know, Donald Trump went to Lordstown and said, don't move, don't, don't leave. The jobs are all going to be coming back, and now Lordstown is a ghost town. He, he, did, he did nothing to help Lordstown. All right, let's four, take another 4, question. 4,500 workers lost their jobs there. Yep. Let's, ask, let's take another. Uh, do we have one down front here? Okay, we'll try that, and then this back, back here in the middle. Okay. Hi, Senator. I'm also going to call you Connie's lovely husband Thank in you. solidarity with That'll Connie, work. but sen <laughs> Senator, to be respectful. Uh, I'm not going to ask you which candidate you're supporting for president, but I do think because of the nature of bad faith actors in Congress that predated Donald Trump taking the White House, what are some of the perspectives that you're listening for or value in a candidate? when they're talking about particularly the role of the Senate and how the Senate needs to change in order to actually you know, represent the will of the people to get legislative work done and to serve as not only a proper check on the White House, but an actual legislative body? Um, good, very good question, thank you. Um, there, there, there is, a, there is an, an, an inherent conservative bias now built into the Electoral College and to the Supreme Court uh, for a whole host of reasons. Um, that conservative bias will continue certainly for an, a period of years from now, I mean, not certainly, but likely. Um, I mean, I'm, the, court, the court can change fairly quickly, of course. Um, but I, that, that's why, I, if you had asked that same question three years ago, I would, not have, I would not have come up with the same answer. My answer now is, for us to do what we need to do to, to sort of break that conservative bias. And uh, uh, George Will once said, there's a, um, I don't quote George Will a whole lot, but George Will, George Will said, it's a lot, of, he said, it's easier to be a, con a conservative than a progressive because conservatives just say stop, no, repeal, nothing. And progressives say, no, here's how, here's how we want to do Medicare. And here's how we want to do clients. So, so we, we have, that one of the reasons that when Emerson talked about the, the centuries old battle between privilege, conserv he said conservators, conservators and innovators is the term he used, conservatives and progressives. Um, conservatives want to hold onto their wealth and stature and money. Progressives want to move the country forward. So um, that's why our progressive victories are short, short lived, but really big when we win, and then we play defense because the, those with money have all kinds of advantages. Um, that's why I believe in 2020, if we win the Senate and win the White House, and I think our chances of winning the Senate are appreciably, I mean appreciably better than six months ago, and, and growing. If we do that, we, we need to get rid of the filibuster. That's what I wouldn't have said three years ago. Uh, and we need to, to move quickly on a number of things. And you know you could you could list your favorite things. What those you know? And by, I'm, I'm, I would be chairman of the banking committee. The banking committee is actually called banking, housing, and urban affairs. Housing has been stricken for all intents and purposes from the agenda of the banking committee. It won't be if it won't be if I'm. What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, so um, I'm just saying there there are so many things on our agenda. We need we need to move quickly in early 2021 um, so that that progressive era, if we win. Um, can, can, can be developed. Okay, let's take another question, please. You've mentioned several times progressive policies, and the most prominent progressive policy, or at least from the standpoint of being in the news, is Medicare for All. Uh, and since Medicare for All would take away uh, private insurance from people, 
It's the one policy that could lead to the re-election of Donald Trump. On the other hand, the public option is supported by about 70% of the people, and it just seems to me that progressives have a death wish on this issue. Talk really into the mic. Okay. <laughs> I, I, you're right. Um, Democrat, I mean, I, I, I think you're, first of all, I think you're right. I think that on every single issue, um, every single health care issue, Democrats win, except Medicare for all, because, um, because exactly what you said, that, that people would lose their private insurance. Uh, I, I, but I, I would answer it this way. I, I've, I've, I've counseled a number of our Senate, my Senate colleagues that are running for the president and others, to talk more in this terms, that the Democrat, every Democrat on that stage, I believe every single one, wants to get to universal coverage. Some at different speeds, some with different paths, but want to get to universal coverage. President Trump went through Congress, John McCain and two other female Republican senators stopped him from repeal. If you remember a couple of years ago, he's now gone the, to the court. So to win this election, we've got to start making the contrast between what we stand for, we're all for universal coverage, versus what he stands for to take away the consumer protections for, in my state alone, two million people, your state, two and a quarter million people who have a pre-existing condition, um, to take away the drug coverage for seniors, to take away the 25-year-old staying on their parents' plan. Um, we, we've got to make that contrast and show Trump's betrayal of workers and show Trump's betrayal of, of of working class families and their in their health insurance, but that that contrast should be made instead of fighting with each other, which there inevitably is in primaries. But we need to say we need to show that contrast between where we are and what he's doing. Good afternoon, Senator. You recognize me? Oh, I can't because of the light. Ken Ragland. Oh, how are you? How are you, sir? Good to see you. Good, thanks. My question for you is, as I see the overall governmental system, the idea of co-equal branches doesn't seem to be working any longer. And the specific issue I bring up are the tariffs that were imposed last year, which led directly to the closure of the factory that I owned in your hometown and have impacted the factory that I also own here in Chicago. Those tariffs were unilateral. There was no ability to plan for them. Our costs for product coming out of China. And it seems to me that the president does not have that unilateral right to do it, but yet there is no seeming alternatives within the legislative or the court system that causes him to stop or be told you can't do it and recall what's been done. So. I lost a factory that had 150 of your constituents, as you recall, a few months ago. And I've had to lay off staff here in Chicago directly as a result of his actions, which there seems to be no checks or balances on what he did. Um, thank you for that. And um, this, this suit I wear is uh, made 10 miles from my house and made by workers for his company. And the plant now is in Chicago only, Hart Schaffner Marks, and um, was in Cleveland. And it gave all kinds of opportunities uh, to mostly immigrant workers, and you'd walk through that plant. Cleveland's a fairly diverse town, not like Chicago. But you'd walk through that plant, and you'd hear seven or eight different languages. We loved that plant. And I've been to that plant um, how many times? I don't know over the years. Um, yeah, but uh, Trump. Trump. Um, first of all, he he he. The, the question of what he can do in the separation of powers is is complicated. But there was an article. This sounds relatively relatively silly compared to what he's talking about, but um, there's an article in the paper, to, I think in the Times today or yesterday, about how Trump using taxpayer dollars for his airplane and doing a government event in, in wherever, uh, in, in Florida and Medicare or somewhere else, and when he went to South Carolina to the Black College and, and talked about the, um, the sentencing bill, he goes in and makes them into campaign rallies. That's illegal. Um, that's a violation of the Hatch Act, not for him. Presidents can't violate the Hatch Act, but his employees did for being part of that event. But there's no enforcement. There's no inf we, because, because we have a Congress that's so pliable on the Republican side and will do whatever this president wants, we could, we could reassert that power um, if his party would ever do that, but they are, 
they are sheep in the last couple of years, as so you know, or, or worse. Pivot to tariffs. Okay. Talk about so the what they're for. Yeah, the tariffs. Um, the president, first of all, the tar tariffs, he doesn't, he, his, he's not the deepest, most reflective thinker in the White House. <laughs> And I'm not just comparing him to the last one before him, but, but he, um, he really doesn't understand that tariffs are a temporary tool to get to a long-term policy. He doesn't understand that he thinks tar tariffs are, are the policy themselves. And if he had gone into his whole tariff regimen, I, I wrote a book about trade called The Myths of Free Trade, so I thought about this for 20 years. If he had gone into this policy with, or gone into these, into, into, into this, this, program of tariffs, if you will, working, instead of working against Canada and against our allies, working with them and aimed that at the serial, aimed our tariffs at the serial cheaters, China, principally China, Turkey, and South Korea, um, it would have been, and, and planned them to be a temporary tool, it would have been a very different outcome. And so um, it's clear he didn't understand that. We have a Congress now that, that simply won't push back, and we end up with what you just said. And that's, that's the tragedy of this. And I think he, he I, I don't see him changing these policies anytime soon, even though they clearly have been a drag on the economy. Let's do another question. Okay, over on your left. Good afternoon, thanks for coming to Chicago. This may be on the don't ask this question category, but uh, why aren't you in Iowa setting up shop with the caucuses right now? <laughs> All right, so the exit I, I think, is there. I think you're one of those people. I think you're one of those people that get Iowa and Ohio mixed up. <laughs> Three vowels, four letters. I, I, I just, I, in the end, I just to, to, to run for president, you've got to really, really, really want to be president. And I, I love this job, and I didn't really, really want to be president. There's a, there's a story from um, a senator 60 or 70 years ago, surveying his colleagues, once said that. That um, the only cure in the presidential vi in the, pre the only cure for the presidential virus in the U.S. Senate is embalming fluid, and you know I, I just I just don't want to be that guy. But thank you for saying that. We do. You, we should make clear though that we always appreciate that we don't want to look dismissive of people yeah. saying it, right? Yeah, we don't. <laughs> right? No, I'm not dismissive. I just. Okay, good. <laughs> might might a few more women have something to say at some point? Thank you. We have Thank a you. woman down here, I see. Could we? Wait, 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 wait for the, please. Have you noticed the men wait for the mic? Wait for the mic. <laughs> down here? Oh, we have one there, too? Or I just want to. What are you doing? Oh, it is me. Oh, All right, we're, we're going to do you next, I think, OK? We'll do you next. I'm sorry. You're next. Jim, a little faster, Jim. What You're next. Whoa. OK. OK. This person or me? OK. Um, so uh, thank you both for being here. and. Senator, I'd just like to say that when you were a freshman legislator in Ohio, I worked for the Legislative Service Commission, oh. and um, we all had a crush on you. Uh, <laughs> like that's changed. Yeah. That also, Have you seen my Twitter feed? That was also 40 years ago, but thank it you. It was at least, yes, indeed. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on what the Democrats should do in the happy event that uh, we take back both the Senate and the presidency with respect to um, the U.S. role in addressing climate change. Um, thank you for that. Well, the, for the first thing, obviously, is get back in the Paris Climate Accords, which uh, every, every Democratic candidate will do. And keep in mind, 15 years ago, the Republicans recognized climate change, that climate is changing, recognized the human <laughs> The human that, the, that we as human beings were a major cause, and then the Koch brothers fundamentally took over their party and dark money threatened so many of them in the primary, they just wholesale. I mean, some of them were already in the pocket of the oil industry, but their whole party moved in that direction. Um, I, I'll, give you, I'll give you one example. One, I, I think I started, there, there are three or four people in the Senate that are really, really good on this issue that, that put much of their time in Brian Schatz of Hawaii, Sheldon Lighthouse, especially of Rhode Island, and um, the three of us talk a good bit about sort of strategy here. Um, I, and, and, and what we're all thinking is, I'm starting to do this on banking committee. I mean, I, I don't know if we're gonna take the majority. I think we have a very good chance, but we're already starting to think, what, 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 what do we do in banking committee to prepare for 2021? One of those things is begin to put pressure on the Federal Reserve um, to begin to recognize the risks in, in companies investing in fossil fuels. 
and the Federal, I, I talk to Jay Powell, the, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, pretty regularly about this issue. Um, I, I, I can't talk, I can't say now about private conversations, but more and more insurance companies, more and more banks understand much of our financial services industry, understands that they need to start pricing risk in a way that will help us go in that direction. There will be, there will be many parts of the very amorphous at this point, Green New Deal, that we think about doing investments and in it, but, it's, but it cuts, the reason I said that about banking committee, it cuts across pretty much all of the issues that we care about. It cuts across, it's transportation, it's housing, it's banking, it's obviously energy production. And I think you will see coming from a, a, a pretty energized Democratic Party that we will work on, on a lot of those issues, but still not knowing all the details of what we will do. Thank you. Well, on the social side, one of the major problems now is the increased numbers of federal judges that they are managing to push through the Senate. So as a Democrat, um, and while you're still here and we don't have the majority yet, what can you do about that, and, and what is the plan to try and slow down the process of getting so many federal judges, and then we've got the Supreme Court, may RBG live and be well for many years. Um, this is where I don't have a lot of short-term hope. Um, there is not, uh, we, we you know, one, one of the things McConnell did very, very effectively was, I mean, he had the majority so he could do this, but to, to slow walk federal Obama appointees, we got a lot of them through, we didn't get nearly as many, we should forget, we forget Merrick Garland for a minute, but we didn't get through others that we were trying and trying. Um, Democrats are, are certainly not in any hurry to help McConnell move on these, but he's moving on as many of these as he quickly can. Um, I work with Senator Portman in Ohio, we just, okay, we have a bipartisan commission that he and I do that's sort of tradition in Ohio. Um, we just put two new, are about to put two new judges on the court. Neither of them is Federalist Society. They're not, they're not progressives, but they're not, they're, first of all, they're not 39 years old either, like a lot of these, they're older than that. And they're not, they're, they're, they're reasonably sober-minded judges. Um, that's part of our strategy in states where we have set up some bipartisan effort where there's a Republican senator and Democratic senator to send judges to Trump that are not as bad as a lot of the ones you read about. Um, but it's a question of doing everything we can to slow them down. Very few of them can we defeat, only the most um, outrageously right-wing, immoral, or incompetent judges can we do that with, and it's, it's troubling um, for the impact it's gonna have for a lot of years. Next question. Right here in back. Full disclosure, I came no, to hear the cool. senator, but I'd return any time to hear you, Connie, so yeah. thanks. <laughs> My question is this bipartisan issue, and how does anything ever gonna get done if you don't work together? You cited um, Hubert Humphrey as a good model, but it's like everything's at a standstill. Not, you, nobody talks to each other, gets work done, or is that just a media myth? Talk about Roy Blunt. There's a and one from, more part of this, okay. is the media going to end up electing the next president? Well, that's up to the voters. Is what going to? That's up to the voters. Oh, the media, you asked if the media is going to elect the next? Yes, through yeah. the coverage. Well, well is the media going to elect the next president? Well, I, I concerned about a lot of things with 2020, including the Russians, but um, we do what we have to, you know, people say, Trump can do anything and get away with it. Well, 55 or 60% of the country doesn't like him at all, and it's up to us to make sure that, that they vote and that, um, that all the negative stuff, the way they demonized Hillary, uh, all they're gonna do that to the next nominee, male or female, whoever it is, and we've gotta make sure we, we fight back on that. In terms of, um, in, in, in terms of, of bipartisanship, getting things done, um, there's a senator from, not that far away from here, from, from Missouri named Roy Blunt, who's as conservative as I am, as progressive. And he and I were secretaries of state of our states at the same time in the 1980s. And um, he was talking to a group of people. He said, you know, I've known Sherrod Brown for 30 plus years, and we've agreed exactly five times. 
and he kind of laughed and he said, but all five of those are federal law. And I mean, that, that, that's how you legislate, you find things. The guy in the state east, one of the senators from the state east of here, Todd Young from Indiana, um, we're working on some international health issues together. He has a, he has a compassion, I think, I think born of his faith that gets him to a place where he wants to work on, on third world and developing world um, public health issues. So you, f you find those. That's the good news. The bad news is that the whole, the whole media attention in the next 10 weeks is likely going to be impeachment, 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 even though Speaker Pelosi, who I point out in the book, Lyndon Johnson was probably the most effective leader in the last 100 years in the Congress until Nancy Pelosi. Um, and, um, but, um, you know, we, even, even though Speaker Pelosi has passed bills out of the House, um, minimum wage increase, pension fix, net neutrality, um, uh, for a Violence Against Women Act, a whole host of really progressive good things um, that, that Mitch McConnell just sits on. So we, we need to all, in, in unison and with a chorus, sing about what the House has done and the Senate's failed to do legislatively. Don't, don't let conservatives say, well, all, the, all Congress is doing is impeachment. No, it isn't. The House is doing all that. The Senate's refused to do it. But we're not working on impeachment in the Senate. That comes later. So that's just an excuse for them to kill progressive legislation. But we can work on things. But, you know, it's, they're, 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 not, they're not moving on a whole lot of things. Look at the Obama years, as you know. Hey, um, Josh, do we have time for one more? I think we have about five minutes, so we can try to get so three more in. If okay, you so quick answers will get us there. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's not a criticism. I'm just, this is the lightning round. The lightning round of question answering. You were one of my choices for president, too. Thank, oh, thank you, you for everything you've said. I have a question because I have become an MSNBC addict. And one of the things I notice they're not addressing very often is Russian influence on the next election. I know that the laws or the organization against it, at least publicly, there doesn't seem to be much. Can you address that, please? Well, there are. Rachel. Yeah. Rachel's, I mean, Ra Rachel's talked about it a lot. Rachel Maddow. Um, maybe, maybe you go to sleep at 8.59, but, um, <laughs> but, but they, they, no, nobody's, uh, you're right, nobody's, nobody's addressed it enough. I've seen Rachel Maddow do it more than other commentators. Um, uh, I, have, I have a lot of confidence in Mark, Mark Warner and I, the moderate Democrat from Virginia, don't see eye to eye on the Banking and Finance Committee every day, but we, I do like him and I, I see, I, I trust what he's doing on the Intelligence Committee. And even the Republican co-chair of the committee has done reasonably good work there. Um, I, I surely know that, I mean, you, you can look at our foreign policy and so many of Trump's decisions are favor Russia. I mean, you know that, that's no surprise. He, he, he's obviously more comfortable with autocrats than he has small d Democrats. But it, it's a question, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I understand that. Does. Yeah, okay. I, I, the, we've got to keep shining the light on what they're doing. We've got to run up the vote on our side. They're clearly going to cheat. Um, they have, and you know, we we've won electoral college or in the popular vote since '92. We've only lost once, yet we've lost three elections. And on top of that are all the other things that happen in Florida in every election. The things that happen with voter suppression in the state of Texas. You need an ID to vote. If you have a um, driver's, if you have a University of Texas student ID card, that doesn't get you a ballot. If you have a concealed carry permit, that gets you a ballot. It's clear that they want to suppress young voters. We've just got out organized. Okay, let's take another question. You're in the center. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you both for coming here. Um, I originally I am from Ukraine, from Eastern Europe, and um, have a question about uh, foreign policy considering last events between President Trump and President Zelensky, Ukrainian president. Uh, will Congress, Senate, House of Representatives support our country, Ukraine, uh, in struggle against Russia? Um, well, wow. that's, uh, as you know, uh, that, that um, con I mean, Congress has. Congress voted $400 million, almost $400 million. The president held up. You know all those things. We, there, was a, there was a strong commitment from the House and Senate 
um, to help protect Ukraine against r Russian further invasion, incursion, uh, all the things that, that, that troubled history there. Um, we will continue to. The question is what the chief executive does, and, and Trump as commander in chief has a lot of a lot of ability to slow and redirect and all that. That's one issue where Republicans have at least pretended to stand up to him. Um, whether they will at times of impeachment and times of Senate trial is another question. But I think all of the, the good news here is Trump's phone call and his meetings with Zelensky and all have made the nation, and especially the nation's media, who are so important, and members of Congress in both parties pay a lot more attention to Ukraine and what the Russians are doing in eastern Ukraine. One last Thank question. You. One last question here in the middle. Going along with what you've said and what progressives can and can't do, is there any thoughts about if you take back the House and hopefully the White House, not the House, we have the House, the Senate and the White House, to overall do something about the rising hate, hate crimes and violence that's based on anti-Semitism, racism, anti-immigration, that's gotten incredibly violent in this country. Um, that, thank you. Uh, that has to be one of the most important goals we all have. And it's hard when you have a president who's a racist and who engages in divisive talk that has this phony populism and populism, real populism's never racist or anti-Semitic, never divides people. Um, I think it's a challenge to put those genies back in the bottle. We've, we've always had a history in this country. There's always been a strain of, of, anti, of xenophobia and racism. The Know Nothing Party of the 1830s and 40s, uh, they, they would talk about these immigrants that, that spoke a weird language and had a funny religion, and they were German Catholics in those days. So we've always had that strain having a chief executive, as, uh, having a, a president of the United States that, you know, like Obama or even like Bush. Bush, Bush went to a mosque right after September 11th. Imagine that now, right, from a Republican president. So um, I think a new president who will be very, very aware of that will work to bring people together. I also think there are many people who will continue to roil the waters and, and practice that hate speech, but so much of it starts locally. It starts with, you know, what you do is, People of faith or none of the above of faith um, talk to each other in ways of inviting people, if you're a Jew, to invite Muslims to your, to your synagogue. If you're a Christian, invite, if you're a Muslim, invite Christians to your mosque and do all the kinds of things locally because it's, it's going to take a, a, a concerted top, bottom to top effort in our country to, 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 to deal with this kind of hate that, that this president I don't blame him entirely, of course, but that this president has made so much more acceptable. Two Thank things. you for that. I'm so proud of you. I'm so happy to be married to you, and happy birthday. It's your birthday. Okay. <laughs> I hear somebody singing, should we do this? Happy birthday to you. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Thanks, Clayton. Happy birthday, dear Sarah. Happy birthday to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.